Okay, so our next lecture is on the medulla. And so we'll be continuing up following pathways that we talked about in the spinal cord. Um, now, many review books will speak of the rule of fours. Um, and there's some value uh, in this, but just realize these are not entirely correct, but they provide some uh, maybe big picture guidelines for looking at the brainstem. So the rule of fours says that there are four cranial nerves in each section. So the midbrain is associated with cranial nerves um, one through four, pons five through eight, and cranial nerves nine through 12 associated with the medulla. Um, Again, a little inaccurate in the sense that cranial nerves one and two are really central nervous system pathways. Um, how close are they really to the midbrain? Um, yeah, so anyway, but remember that cranial nerves three and four are associated with the midbrain. That's relevant. Um, the pons is actually accurate with the exception that the trigeminal nerve uh, has a very prominent um, pathway and nucleus in the medulla. Right, so it's not exclusively associated with the pons. Another perhaps help, more helpful rule is that to realize that cranial nerves that divide evenly into 12 are found along the midline, so three, four, six, and 12, whereas the other cranial nerves tend to be found more laterally. Okay, another rule of four is that we have four midline pathways or structures that start with M. And so the medial longitudinal fasciculus and medial lemniscus, as their name indicates, are medial. Um, the motor tract of the cortical spinal tract is midline. Uh, that's true in the medulla and the pons, but we will see that when we get up in the midbrain, it's actually lateral. And the motor nuclei, we said that divide into 12 are midline. So the motor nuclei for three, four, six, and 12. Okay, for sensory pathways, um, are in a lateral location. The spinothalamic tract, the spinocerebellar tracts, the sympathetic chain, and the sensory um, cranial nerve nuclei in general. Okay, so maybe some big picture things. And once we've gone through um, all three levels of the brainstem, you can go back and see um, how that fits in. All right, so in this lecture, we'll be going through the medulla, and let's point out a couple of things. First of all, uh, we've been mentioning the substantia gelatinosa as very important for pain and temperature, uh, that the spinal thalamic tract is the outflow of this. And I just want you to appreciate that as we get up into the medulla, it changes names. Okay, it's now called the spinal trigeminal nucleus, and there's an associated spinal trigeminal tract that runs along with it. So this is really the same pathway. The spinal trigeminal nucleus um, is um, pain and temperature, but now for the face, okay? And the pathway that runs along with it, the spinal trigeminal tract, we can kind of think of as our equivalent here in the brainstem um, of the Lissauer's tract, okay? So uh, we will talk about uh, cranial nerves nine and 10 the nucleus ambiguous here is in the medulla. It's the motor nucleus for nine and 10, a little bit of 11. So very important for talking and swallowing muscles. We have the hypoglossal nucleus here, of course, for 12, and the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus here, which is the parasympathetic contribution um, to the uh, vagus nerve. Okay, and we'll point out the solitary nucleus and tract is a very important sensory nucleus for taste and pulse and blood pressure uh, regulation. All right, so we are now in the lower medulla and in the low medulla is where the pyramids cross. So you can kind of make an X right here. Uh, this is the decussation of the medullary pyramid. Okay, so the all important crossing of the cortical spinal tract um, occurs right here, okay? Now, back in this part of the medulla, we're used to seeing the dorsal columns back here. And we're still looking at the dorsal columns, um, you know, because this, this is still the fasciculus grossalis, the fasciculus cuneatus, but now we're in the medulla. And so the white area here is the nucleus the nucleus grossalis and the nucleus cuneatus. All right, so uh, this is the all-important synapse 
here for vibration and proprioception. Okay, and so as we go higher, we'll see that these uh, nuclear groups become larger, and then we will eventually see where these fibers cross. Okay, as we move out laterally, we have the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract. Okay, and again, this is the equivalent of the substantia gelatinosa in the brainstem. Okay, and the equivalent of Lissauer's tract in the brainstem. So this is pain and temperature information for the face. Now, out in this location, uh, we have the spinal thalamic tract. That's about where we've seen it in the spinal cord. And uh, what you'll notice in your handout is that I put a little asterisk by um, pathways and structures that you need to be able to identify at every level. And you'll notice that I stopped putting an asterisk by the spinal thalamic tract. And that's because I want you to know that it's in the lateral medulla and pons, but it doesn't really stand out as a distinct pathway. Um, so realize that it's there, um, but you won't have to, uh, for a practical exam, be able to identify it um, as we move higher up. Okay, we do also have the dorsal and ventral spinal cerebellar tracts here. Um, but again, these become a little murky in terms of um, how to separate them from other pathways. And so we'll stop pointing these out as well as we move up through the medulla. Okay, um, so this was the ventral horn and the spinal cord. And so what we're seeing here is still a continuation of the spinal accessory nucleus. All right, so this is 11 supplying the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid. Okay, so these are structures that are labeled. And again, the important thing here, the most important is that we're at the level of the decussation of the corticospinal tract. Now, as we move up one level, you'll notice that we have these fibers that seem to be uh, moving in this circular manner, okay? And so what we're seeing here is the crossing of vibration and proprioception. And so now these nuclei back here are really large. So this is the nucleus grossalis, the nucleus cuneatus. Okay, it's still a little bit of the fasciculus cuneatus and tiny bit of the fasciculus grossalis here. So vibration and proprioception synapses. And after that, it crosses over and it begins to form this pathway here. And this pathway, which will become larger and um, easy to identify here and separate a right and a left as we move up, this is the medial lemniscus. Okay, so what is the medial lemniscus? It's really the continuation of the posterior columns. It conveys vibration and proprioception, but it's crossed. Okay, so if you were asked, what would a lesion here result in? The answer would be ipsilateral loss of vibration and proprioception in the arm and leg. But once we get out into the medial lemniscus, now it's crossed. So if you damage half of the medial lemniscus, your vibration proprioception deficits will be on the opposite side. So these fibers right here that cross over are called internal arcuate fibers. Okay, this is the equivalent of the ventral white commissure for pain and temperature, okay? Because pain and temperature crosses in the spinal cord, vibration and proprioception crosses in the medulla. Okay, remember that the cortical spinal tract here is midline along with the medial lemniscus. So we're gonna appreciate this relationship all the way up. Okay, and there's another pathway up here that kind of stands on top of the medial lemniscus and this is the tectospinal tract. So remember the tectospinal tract comes from the tectum, uh, the superior and inferior colliculus, and it has to do with head turning in response to a visual or auditory stimulus. So this is just going to the cervical spinal cord to turn your head. Okay, the nuclear groups, we've already pointed out nucleus, uh, grossalus, and cuneatus. Uh, we also have out here, again, the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract, pain and temperature for the face. Okay, and a very important nucleus right here. Again, it's midline, motor, the 
Cranial nerves that divide by 12 equally are midline, so this is the hypoglossal nucleus. Okay, and we can kind of imagine some fibers coming out this way. It'll show up a little bit better later. And this is the hypoglossal nerve, which exits kind of out here, uh, just lateral to the medullary pyramid. Okay, so we have the hypoglossal nerve. And um, we will see as we move out that there's another nucleus here, as we move up rather. This is the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, but I'll point that out on the next one. And then out laterally here, we have the solitary nucleus and tract. This is an unusual structure because the pathway here is dark and the nucleus, the solitary nucleus moves um, around it. Okay, so again, this picture we just went over is the sensory decussation, the internal arcuate fibers here for nucleus grossus and cuneatus crossing over to the opposite uh, medial lemniscus. Okay, and so we have the hypoglossal nerve, dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and the nucleus solitarius and tract. Now, I don't uh, require you to be able to identify this, but it is very important that you recognize that the nucleus ambiguous Okay, no typo there, UUS is in the lateral medulla. And I wouldn't ask you to identify it because its location is ambiguous. I mean, you couldn't say, is it here or is it there? But you need to know it's in the lateral medulla. It's part of lateral medullary syndrome. Um, that is very important. All right, so let's talk about the solitary nucleus and tract. Uh, to highlight the S here, to say this is a sensory nucleus. Sensory for 7, 9, and 10. And so um, several important things to say about this. It gets information from viscera and the head, throat, thoracic, abdominal cavities. Um, so stretch receptors in the lung, when you learn about this in pulmonary, uh, these, um, these are destined for the solitary nucleus and tract. Um, and I'll say just a little bit now about uh, pressure receptors in the arterial system, like the aorta, the carotid artery. And so information, especially when your pulse is going up and your blood pressure is going up, are sensed by these pressure receptors, which then feed into the solitary nucleus and tract. Okay, this is also the sensory nucleus for taste. Remember that the anterior two-thirds of the tongue for taste is seven, posterior of the one-third is mainly nine. And so taste goes to the solitary nucleus. And so if we have a lesion of the solitary nucleus or tract, we'd have a loss of taste. And, um, and I'll explain here why your heart rate may go up and your blood pressure uh, might be unstable. So here are pressure receptors in the carotid body, sinus, and in the aorta. And so nine and 10 here, sensory are detecting this. And the information feeds into the solitary nucleus and tract, which is right here. Now, this is right adjacent to the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Okay, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus is the parasympathetic contribution to the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve in its parasympathetic function, um, remember parasympathetic is rest and digest. It's going to slow the heart rate down. So when your heart rate and blood pressure is going up, the solitary nucleus and tract gets that information. It excites the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, which will then bring your pulse back down, bring your blood pressure back down. Okay. It also, um, the solitary nucleus and tract inhibits the preganglionic sympathetics. Okay, sympathetics are fight or flight. It's going to push your blood pressure up. So the inhibition here, um, again, is important in bringing your pulse and blood pressure down. So this reflex here, the baroreceptor reflex, uh, then the solitary nucleus and tract is a central player in um, that whole process. Okay, and so here is taste for seven anterior two thirds of the tongue and for nine posterior tongue. And so solitary nucleus uh, and tract is important for taste. And this goes up to the thalamus like any other sensory input that's called the solitary thalamic tract. Um, so you could have some loss of taste here with the lesion of the solitary nucleus or tract. Now the nucleus ambiguous, I said its location is somewhat ambiguous. 
um, in the lateral medulla. But to highlight the M here that you remember, this is a motor nucleus, most importantly for nine and 10. So this supplies the pharyngeal and laryngeal muscles. And so if we have a lesion here, we'll see this in lateral medullary syndrome, you have dysphagia that is prominent. Okay, if you destroy the nucleus ambiguous, these patients are at very high risk for aspiration and getting a pneumonia. Okay, and a lesion of the nucleus ambiguous then also, because of the effects on laryngeal muscles, causes dysarthria, so a slurred speech. Frequently dysphonia, so that's a soft, hoarse voice, and often with hiccups. Okay, this is probably the only neurology syndrome you need to know about that's associated with hiccups. Okay, so I hate to say, but if you see a national board question and its patient has neurologic symptoms and they have hiccups, almost certainly they're wanting you to know the lesion is of the nucleus ambiguous in the lateral medulla. All right, so here's the nucleus ambiguous. And so the muscles here, nine and 10, uh, exit through the jugular foramen uh, here to supply pharyngeal laryngeal muscles. That's the most important um, function. Now, as we move up a little higher, um, let's still point out that we have back here the uh, nucleus gracilis and cuneatus, and a little bit of the fasciculus cuneatus, maybe a little of the fasciculus gracilis and still internal arcuate fibers. Okay, but notice now the medial lemniscus is huge. Okay, and that's because as you go higher, more and more of these fibers have had a chance to cross over. And so again, if we say this is the right medial lemniscus, okay, that is getting information from the left nucleus gracilis and cuneatus. So again, a lesion here would produce contralateral loss of vibration and proprioception whereas a lesion here would produce ipsilateral loss of vibration and proprioception. Okay, so again, internal arcuate fibers. On top of the medial lemniscus, again, we have the tectospinal tract. Okay, and then the other midline pathway here is the cortical spinal tract, is the medullary pyramids. So remember, as we think of this as traveling kind of north to south, a lesion here, it hasn't crossed yet, and so our weakness would be um, on the contralateral side. Okay, so we pointed out nucleus gracilis cuneatus, and still we have the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract, pain and temperature for the face. All right, and here we still have the hypoglossal nucleus, and now I think we can see a little better. Can you see these fibers traveling down right here? That's the hypoglossal nerve, which remember is the only nerve that exits between the medullary pyramid here and the inferior olivary nucleus here. Okay, inferior olivary nucleus, uh, kind of think of that as a displaced cerebellar nucleus. We'll talk about this and its function in the lecture on the cerebellum. Okay, so lateral to the hypoglossal nucleus, we have the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus right there. And then this is the solitary tract and the nucleus goes around it. Maybe we see a little better here. The tract is the dark area, the nucleus is around it. So remember sensory for taste, sensory for pressure uh, receptors in the uh, vascular system and also stretch receptors in the lung, all sensory information that goes into the solitary nucleus and tract. Nucleus ambiguous is again in this ambiguous location in the lateral medulla. Okay, and so here we have all of those structures labeled. Um, so again, I am not pointing out or asking that you know the spinal thalamic tract, the ventral and the dorsal spinal cerebellar tract. They're there, but I just think they don't they're not distinct enough to ask you to be able to identify them in that location. All right, so dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, again, is parasympathetic. So it slows the heart, stimulates the GI tract, rest and digest, okay, in contrast to the sympathetic system. So if we had a lesion of the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, your heart rate might go up because you're losing that parasympathetic contribution. 
and also medications perhaps that block parasympathetics. These are called anti-muscarinic or anticholinergic medications. Um, then you would have a tendency to um, lose uh, stimulation of peristalsis, so patient would be constipated, urinary retention, and you lose the uh, effect to slow the heart rate down, so the heart rate would go up. That's called tachycardia. So the most common medications probably that we use that have this effect are a group of antidepressants called tricyclic antidepressants. And so um, we worry using this, and especially as patients get older, um, that we'll have uh, some of these side effects. All right, just a picture showing you um, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and we've kind of emphasized its effect on the heart and the GI tract, but of course, has an important uh, role for the lung, uh, liver, and kidney as well. All right, now we come to two very important syndromes of the medulla. And so the whole point of learning this is that you're able to localize lesions and make clinical sense out of the medulla. So you need to know what is in the medial medulla, what is in the lateral medulla. So the medial medullary syndrome describes the effects of three um, anatomical areas that are affected in the medial medulla. Remember that the anterior spinal artery, which comes off of the vertebral, supplies the medial medulla. And so if we have a stroke there, it affects three pathways, the cortical spinal tract, the medial lemniscus, and the hypoglossal nucleus. And so here they are, cortical spinal tract, medial lemniscus, and the hypoglossal nucleus. So a stroke right here, we can imagine what kind of deficits this patient is going to have. The lesion of the cortical spinal tract will produce contralateral weakness, okay, opposite arm and leg. This is an upper motor neuron pathway, so you'd have upper motor neuron findings like brisk reflexes, clonus, Babinski, and the opposite side of the body. We've said that the medial lemniscus uh, is crossed information uh, for vibration and proprioception. So a lesion here would give contralateral loss of vibration and proprioception. And remember the cranial nerves don't cross except for four, and that doesn't really matter clinically, um, uh, or at least very rarely. So um, a lesion of the hypoglossal nucleus will give us weakness of the ipsilateral half of the tongue Remember, when you protrude your tongue, each half of the tongue wants to push to the midline. So if we have a lesion of one hypoglossal nerve or nucleus, then the tongue gets pushed in the direction of the weak, um, on the weak side. Okay, so here's a nice drawing to show you what medial medullary syndrome looks like. Here's the cortical spinal tract. So if we have a lesion in the medial medulla, the patient will have contralateral weakness. Here is the ascending posterior columns and medial lemniscus. So if we have a lesion here affecting the medial lemniscus, the patient will have contralateral loss of vibration proprioception, right? But if you lesion the left hypoglossal nucleus, um, then the tongue is gonna get pushed to the left. And so here looking at a patient with a left medial medullary syndrome, They'll have weakness and loss of vibration proprioception in the right arm and leg, but the tongue is going to push away uh, from the weakness, away from the sensory loss. Okay, so that is medial medullary syndrome. Um, this would be um, kind of a classic appearance here in the medulla of uh, medial medullary syndrome. Um, I saw a patient years ago who had bilateral medial medullary syndrome, and this so we have here a lesion in both sides. Uh, this is called the heart sign because it has kind of an appearance of a heart uh, ischemia in that area. And uh, these patients are very devastated because now, now they have bilateral weakness, bilateral loss of vibration proprioception. And if you destroy both hypoglossal nuclei, um, you have significant tongue weakness and therefore difficulty swallowing. All right, so as we go through this, now very important that you know what is in the lateral medulla, 
because lateral medullary syndrome is just one of those most often asked board questions. So let's start with the pathways here. We know the cortical spinal tract is midline, the medial meniscus is midline, the tectospinal tract is still in this location, and then here's the hypoglossal nucleus, which is midline. Okay, this whole area right here is the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. And this is the solitary nucleus here and tract. The pathway is dark. So this is the vagus nerve. And so the vagus nerve, of course, gets its parasympathetic contribution from the dorsal motor uh, nucleus. Okay, but the nucleus ambiguous, which is somewhere in here, it will contribute motor fibers to the vagus for talking and swallowing. But then we're also going to have sensory information coming in from the vagus that will be going into the solitary nucleus and tract. Okay, so again, this is all kind of an integrated uh, function here. And remember the importance of the relationship between the solitary nucleus and tract and the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Uh, we can follow the hypoglossal nerve fibers here exiting between the inferior olive and the medullary pyramid. So that has to be hypoglossal nerve right there. And also uh, quite distinct here, some have called these the dog ears of the medulla because it has a floppy dog ear appearance. And this is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Remember that every level of the uh, brainstem connects with the cerebellum. And for the medulla, it's the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, so most of this is information that's going into the cerebellum. Remember that three out of our four spinocerebellar pathways travel through the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Now, one other pathway here that is very important clinically, notice this kind of has a salt and pepper appearance. And so the dark running through this is a pathway. And this pathway is called the lateral vestibulospinal tract. It's traveling through vestibular nuclei here. We have a medial and an inferior vestibular nucleus. Okay, I'm, I won't ask you that. But you should know the pathway here is the lateral vestibulospinal tract. Remember, this is the powerful extensor upper motor neuron pathway for extending the arms and legs. And this is the one clinically very relevant here that is overactive in patients who have decerebrate posturing. So they're in a coma and their arms and legs straighten. Okay, the pathway that's doing that is the lateral vestibulospinal tract. All right, we have back here the fourth ventricle. And then this material back here is the choroid plexus. Okay, and so here's just a label diagram uh, showing you everything um, that we just talked about. Okay, so lateral medullary syndrome. Uh, I mentioned many times probably, but a top five board question for neurology, almost always. And that almost every neuro exam, I think step one, step two, the national board subject exam for the third year clerkship, People just love lateral medullary syndrome. And I think it's because there's so much anatomy here and such interesting clinical findings. So what is in the lateral medulla? Well, we just pointed out that vestibular nuclei are there. Okay, we have our descending sympathetics. So the first order sympathetics that um, are traveling down to uh, T1 to L2 of the spinal cord. The nucleus ambiguous is in the lateral medulla. We just pointed out the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Okay, and the spinal trigeminal tract and nucleus is in the lateral medulla. And the spinal thalamic tract is in the lateral medulla. So it's a lot of anatomy, but let's try to break this down. If you have a stroke involving the vestibular nucleus, then uh, that is going to produce an imbalance in terms of input from the semicircular canals. So it ends up that one ear is telling the brain something very different than the other ear. So from a patient perspective, that causes vertigo. And if you look in the eyes, you'll often see some nystagmus because of the disruption of vestibular information. If you have a lesion of the descending sympathetics, that's going to give you a Horner syndrome. 
in the uh, ipsilateral eye. If you have a lesion of nucleus ambiguous, that will give the patient dysphagia, dysphonia, hiccups, and the nucleus ambiguous is very important for elicitation of the gag reflex, will be, which will be diminished on the side of the lesion. Oftentimes hiccups, again, is just kind of a good clue that that's what you're dealing with. Okay, the inferior cerebellar peduncle, a lesion here will cause ipsilateral ataxia with finger to nose testing. All right, but here is our kind of classic crossed finding for lateral medullary syndrome. Um, so if you have a lesion in the spinal trigeminal nucleus and tract, you get ipsilateral facial numbness. And on examination, there'll be a loss of pain and temperature in the ipsilateral face. Whereas if you have a lesion of the spinal thalamic tract, remember this crossed way down in the spinal cord. So the patient will have contralateral arm and leg numbness and sensory loss to pain and temperature. All right, so the blood vessel involved here is the pica. Uh, the pica supplies the lateral medulla and the undersurface of the cerebellum. So notice the ataxy here is not just from the inferior cerebellar peduncle, but also the inferior cerebellum is affected. Okay, but this can be a bit confusing. Remember the pica comes off of the vertebral. And so the occlusion can either be of the vertebral or of the pica. Okay, so statistically, I think vertebral occlusion is actually a bit more likely than a pica occlusion. And uh, we'll discuss this in the stroke next, lecture next year, but um, this can occur from dissection of the vertebral artery. Um, I've seen two patients after a chiropractic adjustment that had a vertebral artery dissection. Um, I saw a patient who had a vertebral artery dissection after hang gliding. Um, and so there are a number of different things here, but in a young person, this would often be with neck pain. And then these constellation of symptoms, we would think about a dissection of the vertebral artery. Okay, so many thanks here to Kelly Kim, former medical student who made all of these drawings for me. And uh, so this shows the anatomy of lateral medullary syndrome. Um, so first, nucleus ambiguous. So that will give us our dysarthria, dysphonia, and hiccups. Spinal trigeminal tract and nucleus will give the ipsilateral loss of uh, facial sensation to pain and temperature. A lesion of the vestibular nuclei will give the patient um, vertigo, and you'll see nystagmus on exam. Here's the inferior cerebellar peduncle and the undersurface of the cerebellum that will give ipsilateral ataxia. Here are the descending sympathetics that will give the patient a Horner syndrome. And here's our spinal thalamic tract. And I've tried to point out many times here as we've talked about this pathway that it's in the lateral medulla because this is our uh, crossed uh, finding here in lateral medullary syndrome. All right, so let's uh, show a quick little uh, video of a patient uh, with lateral medullary syndrome. Down. Yeah, I started this thing go uh, five, six times, and in the same time, I could catch my breath. The, after this, I start feel real dizzy. Yes, I start hushing by my, my throat. I, I you had dizziness, and your throat was hoarse? Hoarse, yes. Uh huh. My way, she gave me two aspirins. Now, you've had apparently some uh, hiccups since this time, is that right? Well, I started yesterday, when I, I got a real bad yesterday, mm -hmm. I started my hiccups. I see. On the face or in the arms, it's new. Numbness yeah. or tingling? It's looking like this side. It's a little bit numb. On the right yeah. side of your face yes. there? To this side. How about on the arms? Any the arm, numbness? Only on my face Okay. my lips. I think uh, when Dr. Sao saw you the other day, yes. he felt that you had a little decreased sensation in that left arm and leg. But you, you haven't noticed that. No. Okay. Now it's okay, everything. Mild ptosis on the right. And there is some mild pupillary asymmetry.
with uh, the right people being smaller, especially when uh, we dim the lights. A little bit of nystagmus there. Here to left. I feel better this side. Than this. Which one is more normal? This side. Okay, and compare it here. Mm -hmm. What you said, numb. numb equal to that. No, I feel it more on this side. Okay. How about that compared to that? Over here, it has none for this. Okay, and compared to that? I feel it more on this side. More on that side than yes. this side? A lot more or a little more? A little more. If this is a hundred percent, how much is this? This is about, about half. About half. Okay. Sometimes yeah. goes just. So you have this. more control with which hand? This. This hand. Okay. My finger. Mm -hmm. Touch your nose. My finger. Your nose. Just a little bit of ataxia there. Okay. Oh, and I don't know how well you can see that. At the cerebellum and the medulla. Uh -huh. yeah. um, but here we can see a stroke in the lateral medulla. Now, when we get to MRI scan, I will tell you that flowing blood on an MRI looks dark. So this is the left vertebral artery, which is patent. But we have an occlusion over here of the right vertebral artery. And so then he's had a stroke in the distribution of the pica. All right, so spend some time on that. Uh, I would make sure, I would try to draw this out as much as possible. The more things you can draw out, I think uh, it sticks a little bit better and uh, we'll contrast through these different brainstem syndromes a little bit as we go up.